<laughs> All right, John, we made this joke about how many seats we needed, and we capped at 35, and I said, then we can brag that it was standing room only, Jess. <laughs> Uh, you took a page right out of Mel's book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Well, you know, Mel has been my teacher before. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Scott. Her book, Home is Where Your Politics Are, Queer Activism in the U.S. South and South Africa, was published this year by Rutgers University Press. I am Tamara Denmark-Bailey, one of the facilitators of West Virginia Wesleyan College's faculty lecture series. Um, Dr. Scott is my colleague at West Virginia Wesleyan College, and she's one of my friends. Um, a travel friend, a lunch friend, um, just a, a dear friend of mine. Before that, however, she was one of my students, okay? Um, I had just returned from a National Endowment for Humanities at Georgia State University that studied civil rights in the U.S. South and South Africa, and I was dying to teach someone, right? And I had Laurie Goh's job at the time, which was called Intercultural Relations. And I begged and begged, because I taught before I came here, can I please teach this class? Can I please? And uh, Trina Doberstein gave me permission. And um, I was allowed to teach it. Only one person signed up. Her name was Jess Scott. <laughs> And it was nice because we were able to navigate the course. The course was originally taught um, as a lit course, literature in the US South, and this is coming from a history major, and then um, literature in South Africa. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind. And I thought, how could I teach this class in my wheelhouse, which is history, but also make it interesting, I guess, mainly to one person, which is times maybe 50 of who are here this evening, but we'll just leave that alone. Um, but she probably thought I had a little too much energy um, whenever we were teaching this class, because I do have a tendency to get a little overexcited. But she completed the class successfully. Long story that she informed me of that I had completely forgotten, but you can ask her about that. <laughs> um, and eventually, she ends up traveling to South Africa. Um, she came back bearing the equivalent of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, <laughs> which was uh, signed books by Sindiwe Magona, okay? Everyone she had written. And I had read, I'd say, two or three at the time. But I'm telling you, I was going to say only three people, me, Mel, and Jess, know who Sindiwe Magona is, but apparently Abby does. <laughs> so there are four of us. Um, maybe one of these days we will teach um, some Sindiwe Magona uh, whenever we get a chance. But honestly, um, this was a fangirl moment for me, to see somebody take something I love, travel, and even think about me. It makes me tear up. I remember Mel saying, she has books for you. We were literally in the Kroger aisle where the organic food is. And I remember thinking, I can't wait to get these daggone books, right? <laughs> this is so exciting, it was like Christmas Eve. So again, fangirl moment number one, okay, full circle moment number one. Soon Jess would begin her studies, which naturally led to the writing of this book. Um, one of the gifts of working at a small liberal arts college in your backyard is that we know each other and we understand the importance of our work. And the dean at the time, Boyd Creesman granted sabbatical to Jess, which allowed her to conduct valuable research essential to this dissertation. Upon her return, Boyd invited her to share her work um, that eventually would become this book at a campus-wide lecture. Tonight, Jess is here to share this book with all of us. Full circle moment number two, fangirl moment number two. Um, before Jess hops into the discussion of this book, I'd like to take a few minutes um, to talk about her journey. So Jess, you wanna join me? Yeah. All right. So welcome, Jess Scott. I almost brought a red pen, <laughs> but I stuck with my, my copper one. Characteristic. <laughs> All right. So one of the things I think, and especially as honor students are here, I think it's important for you to understand our journey as students but also um, as in graduate studies and then our professional careers because we were you at this time. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you landed at Wesleyan. Yeah, and I'm also gonna retell, I didn't know we were doing all that. Um, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna tell that story <laughs> um, from, my, from my memory as well um, because- uh, I have students in here, so don't be I know too this generous. Is, I'm, not, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm embarrass you. <laughs> no, generous. What I was gonna say was- <laughs> I won't tell that part of it. Um, 
what what I was going to say was this is a like this is a celebration of the of the book, um, the book that I've written. But this is actually a fangirl moment for me. <laughs> um, so I I didn't know that you were going to say all that, but. Um, yeah, to be sitting here with Dr. Bailey um, talking about this work, um, just yeah, I'm constantly in awe of her, um, and so to to it's just an honor to be here um, and to be in conversation with you. So where I'm from, um, I'm from Clarksburg, um, not Bridgeport, uh, not Bridgeport. She, she was the first person to make that distinction for me. <laughs> Um, and uh, I went to Liberty High School. I know that some of you in the room probably went to Liberty High School. Um, it's closing this year. Um, I went to Wesleyan. Um, so uh, that's where, yeah, that's where I met uh, Dr. Bailey. And um, my uh, memory of that class is that I had taken a course called uh, Feminist Criticism, which uh, the students enrolled in the course at the time seemed to think meant criticizing feminism. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to say that um, coming to a place where we have a gender studies program, uh, we've come a long way. <laughs> so um, the course was taught by um, the late uh, and renowned um, Irene McKinney, um, who was once poet laureate of our state. Uh, and she, she talked about bell hooks in this class. And I didn't know anything about black feminism or black feminist thought. And um, I sort of was, it was a sort of cursory mention. It was a story about a, uh, an event where Bell Hooks had been in a conference. There were a lot of white people there. And she was like, geez, this conference is racist. And the people in the room were like, why was she saying that at the conference? How embarrassing. Um, and I thought, but why wouldn't you say that if that's the dynamic? So I wanted to know more about black feminism. And I went to Dr. McKinney and said, uh, to Irene McKinney and said, you know, like, can, can you tell me more about this? Can you teach me a class about this? And she said, I don't really know that much about it. Uh, but she handed me like a bibliography um, and of all of these books to read and look at. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. And I understood years later why she had done that, because uh, she confessed later she was, I, had, I hated teaching, she said. <laughs> she, said I, she said, I loved writing poetry, but I hated teaching. Um, and so I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I, I went to Dr. Meadows. Um, I'm also a student of hers. And I said, you know, like, I, I need to learn more about this. Like, there's, I don't know anything about black feminism. And I understood everything about what uh, feminism that uh, people were writing about in the class. But like, what, what's going on? Like, what are the issues um, that black feminists are talking about and thinking about? Um, those issues are called intersectionality. Um, but yeah, I didn't know anything. And she said, oh, let's ask Tamara. Um, and so she sent me to Tamara. And I said, like, I need to know about this. Um, and Tamara did agree to teach the course. And now I know why. Um, and I cannot imagine you know, what I brought to that experience. <laughs> because you know, I, yeah, I was really interested in reading. I was really interested in hearing about it. But I just had no like, background or no um, you know, kind of information about uh, what we were talking about. But we did, we read all of those books. I, did, I met Cindy Way Magona. I ended up driving her. Uh, she, she has done a language series for children in South Africa to preserve the Xhosa language um, because a lot of indigenous languages around the world are at risk of dying out um, just because of colonialism, um, but also, you know, the that if English or other colonial languages are the ones that are used for everything official um, and those languages aren't taught in schools, um, you know, it's just like there's a dynamic there. And so Sandiwe Magana has done a lot, a whole series of children's books in Isiklosa. Um, and so we met her, um, Melanie Meadows and I met her at uh, a book signing where she was. And we said to her, hey, we we're working with these kids and we were wondering. <laughs> You know, would you be willing to like do something with? And she was like, "Yes, I will come and do like a whole storytelling workshop." We just thought maybe she would read her from her books, um, but she came with us. I drove her, and I'm like the whole time was like, "I don't know what to say to her. I don't know what to say to her. I don't know what to say," uh, because she's so famous, but also because her work through this course had been so pivotal to my just like opening my eyes to the world um, in a way I wasn't used to. Uh, seeing it or from a place where I had never thought about it before. Um, her book of stories, the one that Tamara and I worked with, was, is called uh, Living, um, uh, Living, what's the Living, other one? Loving, Dying, and Dying. Loving, Living, Loving, and Lying Awake at Night. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, riveting collection of stories. Um, and you should 
read it, uh, whether you know anything about South Africa or not. Um, but she came with us, and what she did in the room with those children was she didn't read her books to them. She had them tell stories in Isikosa. Um, and so she was the kind of um, impetus for the storytelling, and she got them started. But they told the stories, and she had them talking. And we couldn't, you know, as volunteers from the US, with no facility in Isikosa, like, we couldn't do that. Um, and so it was amazing. It was just amazing to meet her um, and to see her interact with these children. Um, and yeah, I, what I wanted to say about this book is that this book would not exist uh, if I had not had that class um, with Dr. Bailey. So, um, uh, it changed my life um, through the study of that material um, that, yeah, that I ended up going on this journey um, and uh, getting an education um, outside of the country, um, somewhere I'd never been, in a, an environment I was completely unfamiliar with, um, because she had connected me to that place before I ever went there um, with, uh, through literature. Um, and through a film, I will never forget that film that we looked at, the Madam's film. Oh, God. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I went there, I was really, like, naive, and I had a lot of, you know, strange and sort of, like, you know, typical, like, white do-gooding ideas. Uh, but I wouldn't have made the connection with the space, uh, which I do consider my, like, political home, um, without having taken that class with you. So, um, yeah, I mean, talk full circle, yeah, this... Yeah. So the point, you're, you're in the really book. why I wanted to share that story <laughs> is because as students, your faculty can just, it just takes one person to kind of pluck you out of your comfort zone and introduce something interesting. And what you do with that uh, can be life altering. And did I think that I would be sitting here in 2024 and introducing Jess with this book? No, I was just teaching something cool, right? And I wanted somebody to like it with me. And that neat aspect of I think what touched us being from Appalachian and particularly from West Virginia is Sandiwe Magona's story. She was a domestic worker who was deprived of education because of apartheid. And that woman came to Georgia State as a part of the UN because she was selected out of South Africa to represent women writers. And then they sponsored her tour throughout the United States, Europe. And she made a difference in this kid from Appalachia, from West Virginia, who randomly applied to this NEH because I thought it sounded cool. And I thought I wanted to go to graduate school. And uh, I'll just take this. And it ended up being civil rights in the South, US South, ended up being a focus of my study. So space in that kind of way, where you're from, your neighbors, the way, and Jess talks about this in her book, the politics of um, your geography makes such a difference in the things that you know. And that's why I feel like it's easy for us to write about those things and teach about those things, because we kind of have a lay of the land. We still get shocked <laughs> sometimes. Um, but that, that moment of having that connection and having a student express interest is a, is a neat thing. So take that. And when you, she, you heard her talk about her naivete whenever she was there, it's OK yeah. to not quite know where you are and where you belong. And you're going to be OK. Have an open mind in those moments where you think that maybe you're there to make change. You couldn't be more wrong. You're there to be changed. And it's a fascinating and humbling moment whenever you realize that. Um, shameless plug for study abroad. If you're interested, let me know. OK. <laughs> Um, so back to Jess, tell us a little bit about your major at Wesleyan. <laughs> My major at Wesleyan was music. Um, so um, I am a, a true believer in the general education program uh, because um, yeah, I have a very interdisciplinary background. Um, so I studied music as an undergrad. I did a master's degree in music performance. Um, with the focus on the pipe organ. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but if you want to live in West Virginia and have full-time work, pipe organ is not where it's at. <laughs> um, it's an excellent, excellent um, uh, Sunday gig. Um, but uh, but it, yeah, it's only housed, it's an instrument housed in one building, a church, uh, and Sunday is when they meet, and that's one hour a week. So, um, so yeah, I had to kind of think about, like, you know where where to go from from then, and that's kind of um, how I ended up um, going to South Africa and changing directions into gender studies. But uh, yeah, my background was initially in music, and that was um, 
that was the thing that paid for my uh, degree. So yeah, that's definitely why I was committed to studying it for sure. So I'm sure similar people have the same story about what brought you here and the change. I will tell you, I was a um, interior design major for one semester because my roommate was an interior design major. I could not dress myself or anything else. I came in, thank goodness John had this all laid out. I don't know, I, I had no identity, okay? So in those moments of questioning who you are, it, what you major in in your undergrad doesn't always play a role, or some of you precisely know um, what role your major will play, but that's how the world goes around. Um, and that story, I think, plays, uh, and, and it's still a part of your life, oh, yeah, playing yeah. pipe organ very mm -hmm. much. Um, so how did you, what happened in between undergrad and graduate school that led you to this evolution of study? Well, I had to, um think I guess about what I um, was interested in and um, I had um, contracted a minor in um, I think what I called it at the time was women's studies at Wesley and we didn't have gender studies yet um, and so um, yeah I was looking for something in that area um, uh, Melody, who's my wife now and is here somewhere back there, um, was eligible for a sabbatical, um, and we were looking for you know sort of where we want to go and um, what what we would want to do. Um, and so I found this. I actually found the program that I went to. It's called Gender and Transformation. Um, I found it online. Um, I uh, part of what was happening for me was um, was political, um, which is that, you know, we had had, George W. Bush had been president for eight years, we had all this rhetoric around uh, war and, you know, being um, at war. Um, and so I was just like, I was feeling tired of uh, the kind of like U.S. exceptionalism. I think that that might have died on January 6, 2021. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, like we've had a coup just like, or an attempted coup, I guess, just like many of the other countries in the world have, have had coups. And we've said, that's not fair and free. Um, and so like this, this narrative of like everything in the U.S. is better and we do it we do it sort of like best, we do democracy best, you know, we take it everywhere else. Um, and also the kind of idea that uh, we don't really, I think in a lot of US-based, even gender studies, women's studies programs, it's all focused um, on the US. And at that time, I think intersectionality wasn't like the primary driving thread of gender studies. And so I was really interested in thinking about the world from a place outside of the US. Um, I can't, the, you know, it, it, we're in a very different moment now. Um, and so it's really hard for me to kind of access that anymore, but I was just feeling very tired of um, kind of like the political rhetoric. Well, we're all tired of it still, but um, feeling very tired of the political rhetoric of that time and wanting to be in another space. And I had the opportunity. I mean, not, I, I have to understand, I have to explain that as a, or recognize that as a point of privilege, but I had the opportunity to go somewhere else. And so, so I did. And then where all have you traveled on the continent? <clears throat> um, nowhere in North Africa and only, um, only South Africa and Southern Africa, but um, Kenya and Tanzania, um, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and East Africa, and uh, Ghana. We were in Ghana together, actually. Um, Ghana and um, uh, Sierra Leone um, in, in West Africa. So, like, not extensively, but. Um, <laughs> That's but pretty extensive. <laughs> For most of us. In fact, whenever we went to Ghana, it was Dr. Martin, Jess, and I. And Jess was like, oh, I'll be in South Africa, so I'll just meet you in Accra. <laughs> Which right. was a nightmare, by the way. South Africa is that not on the way to Ghana. <laughs> if, yeah, if you ever want to have lunch with us, you'll learn that the resident uh, the baddie in this room is this one. Um, and we'll, we'll just have that as a private conversation. Um, but I learned some things about what to do when you don't get what you want internationally from Jess, and she took care of business. Um, <laughs> we'll just leave it that way. So how did you come we to Wesleyan, right, <laughs> in a teaching position? Um, uh, they, I think, 
at that time needed somebody to do gender studies. Um, I think um, Ashley Lawson was doing, uh, coordinating like what had uh, become kind of a gender studies minor. Um, and I'm really grateful to her that she named it gender studies and not women's studies because it just allowed us to be more expansive and inclusive in our um, programming and thinking. But um, she was doing a doctorate and so um, they needed somebody to um, coordinate that, that program and so, um, yeah. And it evolved into coordinating it into a major. Yes. Right, yeah. so that's one of the nice parts about university is university evolves because the more and more people have access to it, the more we can transfer ideas. So I learned through literature, and then I used it through history, and then she's evolved into a gender studies program. So the evolution of academics is as much a part of this story as it is about your journey um, through curriculum here and your journeys that you'll take as a result of that. Um, and then tell us how South Africa became, and, and Cape Town specifically, became the hub of your doctoral studies? Um, I was at the um, African Gender Institute, which is at the University of Cape Town, and um, I worked really closely there with um, Jane Bennett, um, and I still work with Jane Bennett. Um, we're talking about writing a book together, um, and she hosted me over the summer um, at the um, African Gender Institute, uh, they're changing from gender studies, the name of the academic program from gender studies to African feminist studies. Um, and yeah, the, the connection with her um, was actually, I had done a master's degree uh, there, but um, to pursue tenure at Wesleyan um, or to have, in other terms, have job security at Wesleyan. I needed to have a, a um, terminal degree, which is like the you know the final degree in your field. Um, and so I had I spent a lot of time talking with Jane about uh, how to make that happen. Um, and the um, South African uh, system um, is much more closely related to the British um, system uh, than the US one, which is, you know, the US one you have to do residency and you have to be like on a campus and do research from there. Um, but in South Africa you apply, you do an, a very extensive uh, research proposal, which I could work with her through email on building, um, and that's part of your application. And they decide whether they can um, supervise that and develop that proposal with you into a project uh, or not. And so um, she, yeah, she guided me through that process. We did that. And so a lot of it, I mean, the the US piece of this book, <laughs> I was teaching full time and I was driving on the weekends. Every weekend I was going to an event like in Atlanta, in Charlotte, in, uh, there's a, the very opening thing happened at a conference in Louisiana. So every weekend that I had free, uh, I was, if anybody was my student at that time, I apologize. Um, but you know, like during the week it was like teaching and on the weekend it was just driving. Um, and I always thought maybe a backup job for me could be like if teaching didn't work out, uh, could be like, you know, long distance truck driving. Uh, that is not <laughs> going to happen. No, no, no. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I was doing a lot of driving on the weekends. Every weekend that I could be gone and at an event um, to record and observe and just uh, take it in as uh, ethnography, um, I was doing that. So um, that's, that's what the US side looked like. And then, um, I mean, again, thanks to Boyd, um, I was able to take a leave of absence for a whole semester and be gone, like from January to July. And so the, South the, the two pieces of this book are very, I mean, the quilt on the cover uh, is really appropriate because they're, they're, they were two different, really different experiences. Um, there was a group that I got connected pretty closely to in Greenville, South Carolina, um, called the Gender Benders. And that was a group of uh, transgender um, organizers. I guess they became organizers. Really, they were just like transgender folks, a couple, like three people who were like, gosh, <laughs> there have to be other transgender people here in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> How do we find them? Um, and so they launched this um, Facebook group and they started getting and they got they have like 300 plus members now 
Um, and so like I connected with them pretty closely, but still, I mean, Greenville's like six, seven hours from here. And so it wasn't, I wasn't able to be like in their space all the time. And so the experience of working with people in the US and working with people in South Africa looked very different. In South Africa, I could, um, I was I was there in Cape Town um, all the time, and so I volunteered for an organization called Free Gender, um, and they weren't really part of my uh, research except that I interviewed like the founder of that organization. I didn't interview anybody else from that organization, but I through volunteering with them, I got into all kinds of other events that I never would have even known about um, or been able to to access um, because I was giving time and resources and energy to them um, and you know part of that meant just driving um, Funeka Soldat wherever she needed to go so like I was just driving her every day um, and she's like we got a meeting to go to and I'm like oh okay well who's this with oh well it's with the you know the hate crimes committee which you know is like the minister of justice is the one who's on the you know and this is a meeting of like all these really important organizations and I was like Oh, okay. <laughs> that will be useful for me. Thank you. Um, but you know, she just needed to get there. So um, it was a very qualitatively very different experience um, interviewing and talking to people in the South, in the U.S., um, than it was um, being in South Africa, where it could kind of be embedded in the context, like all of the time. Um, yeah, which feels like a little bit the opposite of maybe what uh, what it seems like it would be. Um, but but. It was very, very different in terms of like the two experiences of doing research. But yeah, working with Jane um, was what um, kind of kept me connected to UCT. And um, I kind of considered other programs, but I thought I, I really just learned so much from her um, that I'd really just rather work like at that level with her um, doing the kind of supervision of the of the research. Okay, so in. In closing here, so she can um, talk about the book a bit more intimately, um, notice her attire. It's gorgeous. <laughs> okay. Um, but whenever you walk across the stage, she has the flyest, flyest uh, gown, right? In terms of graduation, it's bright red. It's gorgeous. And then the last thing I want to say, you can tell I'm an aesthetics person, even though I told you I can't dress myself. I appreciate other people who can. You often don't get to pick the cover of your book, and you would think if you wrote the darn thing, you'd get a pick. Um, and sometimes you get lucky, but you should, if, just a little, if you ever meet an author, ask him about the cover, because they usually don't get to pick. But you were impressed by the selection of the well, cover. <clears throat> oh, I have a story to tell about the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I had to fight for this cover. The first cover that they sent me, I did not like. And um, I have witnesses here who can attest that we sat around, uh, 10 of us sat around the table like, this is not the cover. Nope, 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 nope. And I wrote back to the editor, and she's like, well, I'm sorry that you and your 10 friends don't like the cover. So I was sort of like, just because I'm in Appalachia doesn't mean, <laughs> just because I'm in West Virginia doesn't mean friends. you can talk to me like that. <laughs> But um, she, uh, yeah, yeah, we went back and forth on that quite a bit. Uh, actually, uh, Crystal Brown is in the room was involved with trying to like dream up other options to kind of show them and be like, this is more what we want. Like, this is more, that the thing is not going to work. And maybe you think I only have 10 friends, but those would be the first 10 people to buy this book, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure you should dismiss them so quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this one I do love. I had asked them to do something with, um, Quilt, something quilted or something with a mosaic because in a lot of um, neighborhoods that you might go to um, in South Africa, I, th I think I noticed this first in Meadowlands, which is outside of Soweto, but, or inside of Soweto, but um, the, uh, there's just gorgeous, gorgeous mosaic uh, artwork um, just on people's like walls and uh, patios. Um, one of the places that Free Gender met um, uh, while I was there, it's called a uh, Wetlands Park, um, and there's just these beautiful mosaics all over the park. Um, and it's not the kind of place that um, you would expect to uh, find, like this beautiful artwork. And so, I think that makes it even more precious. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I had asked for mosaic themed or like quilt themed, and uh, yeah, that's not what we got first. But you see, we ended up with it. So. <laughs> And I want to thank John, too, for the design he did uh, for the social media and the posters. It was eye-catching and gorgeous and just popped so well um, with this book. And I thank you, John.
for the, the graphic design. He, he's also a really good teacher because he's been teaching me for a couple years <laughs> with some tricks of the trade. I probably have too many questions, but he does. But thank you, and I'll leave you to your craft. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, well, yeah. I'm but I did want to like talk about a couple of parts with you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much um, to John and Abigail um, for hosting this because um, they've been so supportive when I came to John and I had like this self-published children's book about my pet pigs <laughs> and said, will you sell this in your store? He was like, yeah, we'd love to sell this in our store. Um, and I have found that it is difficult to market a self-published children's book. Um, and so I'm so appreciative uh, to both of you for your support. Support and so appreciative to Dr. Bailey wherever she went for um, being. Thank you uh, for being willing to um, yeah engage in conversation with me, but also to support the process of um, just kind of like getting the book out there. This is a sort of birthday party for it. So uh, it had one in South Africa, but this is the this is the West Virginia slash U.S. South one. I probably should say a word about that because some of you might be like. West Virginia ain't in the South. Um, and so we're not um, in terms of like, if you think about uh, our origins and being a uh, product of the um, Civil War and um, having split from the Confederacy um, and all the kind of complications um, around that, shaping you know how, how we kind of uh, exist now. But, um, but we are in terms of, if you look at um, human rights, uh, LGBTQ especially uh, legislation, um, we look more like the South um, than, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was showing some students the other day how now the trajectory is, it starts in Florida and then it just goes up. Uh, but, um, we, uh, we, we just look politically so much more like the South, especially now that we have this super uh, Republican supermajority in the legislature. We haven't always had that. Um, and in fact, in the place, uh, you know, when I kind of first talked about this book, that was my whole pitch was sort of like, we haven't always looked like this. Like, we used to be Democrats. You have to, used to have to be a Democrat to be elected here. Um, well, we look much more like the rest of the South now um, in terms of our you know, legislative makeup and uh, the kind of things that are going to affect queer and trans people, um, the legal things. And so uh, that's why, and, and if you look at any of the regional LGBTQ organizations, um, uh, Campaign for Southern Equality or um, Southerners on Free Ground, uh, Southerners on New Ground, um, they're, they group us. They don't spend much time here or pay much attention to us, but they do include us in the South. Um, and so I have played a bit uh, with the kind of boundaries around Appalachia in the South. Um, and I have really worked more at the overlap um, of those two places uh, in a way that a lot of people who aren't from here like wouldn't notice, but y'all might call me out on. So um, in fact, that's what I said in South Africa. I was like, y'all might not, you might not realize it here, but if I said like that the West Virginia's in the South um, at home, people might be like, huh? Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's my explanation of it. But this opening thing is a kind of a, oh, and I wanted to talk about one more choice that I made in the book. So there are no pronouns um, in this book. And so if you refer, and that comes from another fight with the editor, if you, uh, well, that was a reviewer, sorry. If you um, hear me use pronouns uh, in a place that's not a quote, call me out because it's pretty difficult to edit for that. Um, just because of how we tend to, um, uh, not only gender everything, but use pronouns to refer to people. And so I, I started using they um, for everyone in the book, regardless of um, pronouns. And I know that there are people who are very attached to their binary gender pronouns, cis and trans. Um, and so like the point wasn't to misgender people, but there are people in this book who have transitioned um, since I interviewed them. Um, and so for me, I was thinking like, well, why? Why sort of privilege or make people be stuck um, in a place where they didn't stay uh, by using those binary pronouns just because some other people like really like those binary pronouns? Um, especially when we use like they and them um, 
for people that we don't, whose gender we don't know. And there are a lot of people, the writers that I quote, like I don't know them personally. And so the reviewer was like, but on their websites, they have their pronouns. Um, and so I was like, I was like, okay, fine. I will just take out the pronouns. Um, so I did, I just took them out instead of using they, them, because the reviewer was sort of like, well, I don't know. Like some people like are very clear about their pronouns and I don't think you should. So I was like, okay, let me just, I'll just take them out. Um, so I took them out, uh, makes their writing a, like a little bit awkward in some places, but not too much. It just says the person's name over and over again. Um, and so if you hear pronouns, you can, you can be like, hey, flag that. Uh, I should have brought my sticky notes. I didn't. Um, but anyway, like that's a choice I made for that, for, partly for that reason, because I didn't want to stick people with a gender and like assume that they had to stay there. But the second reason is that in Isikosa, um, which I don't use well enough to be able to write in, um, there are not gendered pronouns. There are some gendered terms that people would refer to each other with, but there are not. So if you take a phrase like the verb uh, cook, to cook, ukupeka, um, and you said like he cooks, she cooked, they cook. He cooks, they cook. In English, um, in Isikosa, that would just be upeka, upeka. You know, and a lot of Isikosa speakers, they don't really distinguish too much between he and she. In fact, they mix it up a lot. Um, and so to me, like just to use those um, binary pronouns and to refer to people in gendered ways really like reinforces also the colonial dynamics around English being um, a kind of dominant um, language. And so I couldn't, I couldn't do what creative things I might have been able to do if I, if I actually had facility in Isikosa, but I could definitely decide to take out the pronouns um, in acknowledgement that like, you know, those, those just don't exist in that way in that language. Um, so anyway, the first um, thing that I wanted to share with you is, is a joke that I heard while in Louisiana about West Virginia. Um, so I opened the book with this, and this kind of introduces the concept as well of the, of the map. So if any of you who've ever looked for like, you're like, oh my god, what's the law uh, in this state about you know birth certificates or driver's licenses or uh, what bathroom you can go in and what documentation you have to show or uh, you know can I get married there or whatever it is. If you've ever looked at any of those maps, and you could Google um, later if you haven't seen them, just if you Google like gay rights in the world or LGBT rights, whatever. Um, there's an organization called ILGA that has um, a lot of the global ones. But there's this idea that like <clears throat> you can kind of map policy onto space um, and that you could be able to infer from the color coding of these maps whether a place is sort of friendly, gay friendly, um, or whether you might die at the extreme, um, or live a very sad closeted life, uh, kind of like at the best. Um, and I think we've actually moved beyond that um, in terms of like folks who live here. Um, but th that's the narrative that gets attached to those maps. And so like I was working a lot with, I didn't really write a lot about maps, but I was working a lot in this book with the idea that there are discourses, um, language that get attached to those maps um, and that we kind of carry around um, as a way to kind of code or interpret the world around us. And so da, 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 the first paragraph is about marriage and I'm not interested in that. The second paragraph, however, says, um, <clears throat> when I attended the Bold Not Broken Louisiana Queer Conference at the University of Louisiana in Baton Rouge in 2015, on a weekend I wasn't teaching. Um, a keynote speaker and veteran activist in queer politics in North Carolina, actually one of the people who has transitioned since um, I wrote the book um, and interviewed them, uh, recounted the story of the campaign against Amendment 1 in North Carolina. That was their marriage ban. Um, for those of you who are, who are young, um, there were these individual kind of state marriage bans saying that you know you couldn't get married in this state, uh, even though the federal government didn't recognize it. So it was just a duplication. But you know those lawmakers were like, we really want to make sure. Um, and so all the states in the South up to that point, except North Carolina and West Virginia, had them. Uh, the activist also did some. Uh, sorry, such a, blah, blah, blah. a keynote speaker and veteran activist in queer politics in North Carolina recounted a story of the campaign against Amendment One. The activist also did something else. They said, we had a, I, 
don't have they in the book, just so. We had a, we had a marriage amendment happen in North Kakalaki. I'm not gonna deny, it happened in 2012, way later than everybody else's in the South, except West Virginia, because they never had to vote on one. Woo, West Virginia, progressive, progressive as hell. I like that joke. Um, and so, I, as a West Virginian, <laughs> um, uh, don't like that joke uh, because um, they sort of suggest that like the only reason that we didn't have a ban is because we just like never had to vote on one. But actually, we did have a state organization that worked very hard every. We did have that. That ban was proposed every year, every year. And Fairness West Virginia, our state organization, confronted that ban every year, every year, and defeated it. It was never put on the um, ballot, but. But yeah, it was, it's because of their, uh, their work, which gets erased um, in that story, that we never had to have, that we never had a ban. Um, and the fight in North Carolina was actually very, very ugly. Uh, some of you remember the bathroom bill was very similar to that. Um, and so like, that's the kind of thing about space that happens. Um, but then I want to take you to uh, the uh, great lesbian farmer takeover of rural America. <laughs> um, that's it. chapter two. If any of you don't know about that, uh, I was actually interviewing the person who kind of um, was organizing this program through a series of programs in the USDA. So the USDA had decided like, hey, Obama has said like, we kind of want to stand behind these principles of um, non-discrimination against LGBTQ folks, even though like we don't really have that in federal law yet. Um, we do have that in employment now. Um, the actually the current Supreme Court <laughs> ruled that we have employment protection now. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know, um, but. It's, Anything can happen, but um, which is also another point of this book. Anything can happen anywhere. Um, but uh, the USDA was doing this series of kind of like listening sessions because they were like, hey, you know, like queer and trans farmers might not know that they can access services from us because, you know, we've probably not been the most welcoming to them. <laughs> so maybe we should like put it out there that like if you're gay, uh, we're gonna like give you some money to help support your farming. Um, and there's a farmer in Randolph County who's benefited from that. Um, I know her, but um, they they were just doing these kind of like rural like listening sessions, and I didn't get to go to any of the rural ones, unfortunately. I didn't know about the West Virginia one before it happened, but um, I did go to one in Atlanta, and I met the person who was coordinating this, and. Um, what happened was very, I was surprised to learn, I was in South Africa like watching kind of like news stuff, but Rush Limbaugh picked up the story of uh, these USDA listening sessions and turned it into uh, like, they're sending the lesbians to take over the land. Um, so watch out! Um, and all of these news stories that I'm gonna reference here, because most of this is just like a kind of combination, uh, culmination of uh, Cool. <clears throat> of um, stories and headlines that uh, were spun off of uh, Limbaugh's kind of the rhetoric around all of this, and they were accompanied by these hilarious graphics. In fact, I wish I had realized I would have put them on the screen, but like, they're just like these women who are like wearing flannel. You know, and you're just like, yeah, okay, oh yeah, okay, maybe, maybe. Uh, but um, uh, they, it's kind of, the part of the reason that I wrote about it here was um, I was like, wow, that's, these interviews I just did are super relevant to this story. But um, another reason that I wrote about it is because like the liberals thought it was as funny as the conservatives did. And, you know, as the conservatives thought it was threatening. And so it's like the idea that there would be queer and trans farmers was as foreign to like liberals living in New York and wherever else um, that as it was to the conservatives who were like, these lesbians are coming to take over our land. And the liberals were like, oh, that can't be true. Lesbians don't know how to farm. You know, and it's like, have you ever seen a farmer in West Virginia? Like, whoa. Uh, but anyway, so this is the section that's called the Great Lesbian Farmer Takeover of Rural America. The series of hum summits hosted by USDA to expand their outreach to more populations in rural America was amplified into a conspiracy to take over the last frontier of conservatism. It's characterized that way by liberals and conservatives. By various right-wing blogs before drawing the national attention of conservative media figure uh, Rush Limbaugh. 
Rush Limbaugh's strange and surreal, it's a quote, reaction to the announcement of the summits was critiqued um, by Dan Nosowitz uh, in a piece for the Modern Farmer website. Nosowitz reproduces what Limbaugh said in a talk show, uh, talk radio show about the summits. They are trying to bust up one of the last geographically conservative regions in the country. <laughs> That's rural America. So in case you all didn't know, now you know. Uh, so here comes the Obama regime with a bunch of federal money and they're waving it around and all you gotta do is be a lesbian and want to be a farmer. Um, I, yeah, I forgot to say that, this, that all of this happened in a very different time. Uh, <laughs> than the one we're living in now, so like, yeah. Uh, so he continues, uh, Nosowitz, sorry, continues. There are many obvious things wrong with this line of thought. One is the strange obsession with gay women. All of the blogs and Limbaugh specifically reference lesbians, even though the USDA is extremely clear about this being an event for the entire LGBT community. Another example of the strange and surreal accounts of the USDA summits is the following, authored by Elizabeth Harrington of the Washington Free Beacon. The all-day summit which teach, will teach lesbi lesbian and transgender hillbillies. Oh. Oh. Uh, you guys didn't even know. How to get subsidies from the government, like rural housing loans and community facility grants. Um, excluding this loaded sentence, Harrington otherwise presented a neutral summary of the aims and events of the summit using the USDA's own language. While there are links to other right-wing news publications and blogs embedded in this story, they mostly contain similar Summary language punctuated by a few suggestions of the ridiculousness of the USDA's project. This article is so devoid of the type of editorial commentary Limbaugh invoked, I struggled to conclude whether the writer's primary goal was to inform readers that the summits were happening, because they otherwise might not know, <laughs> given how unlikely they are to follow LGBT-related news, or to suggest that the ideas in the language used by the USDA should seem so ridiculous to Harrington's readership that they require no commentary beyond lesbian and trans transgender hillbillies getting government subsidies. As pointed out by Nozowitz, there's a strange uh, contradiction between the rugged individualist image of rural dwellers and the reality of farming in the 21st century uh, America. Agriculture in this country is heavily subsidized, meaning that the government already has a significant stake in ensuring and subsidizing large-scale farms in rural America. Limbaugh's story about this event relies upon assumptions uh, not exclusive to Limbaugh's conservative audience about who farmers are, what they do, how they think, including presumably how they vote, what they do or do not do in bed, and how farmers relate to the rest of the country. The USDA attempted to answer the question of who is a farmer differently than Limbaugh did, acknowledging that queer people live in every community and are likely a part of every profession. The USDA attempted to reach out to the LGBTIQ identified farmers they assumed already lived and worked in rural America. To inform this alternative definition of farmer, the USDA was relying on census data to operate from the starting point that queer and trans people already live in rural America and the fact that USDA has programs already in existence that could benefit queer and trans rural dwellers if they were not already alienated from government services by decades of discrimination. Limbaugh was mobilizing a discourse antagonistic to queer bodies in rural spaces. This discourse about where queer and trans people do live, should live, are welcome, and are not welcome is deeply embedded in a spatial politics of sexuality that shapes queer and trans people's relationships to the land. Limbaugh's narrative of spatial politics is much more closely aligned to the metronormative narrative of queerness than proponents of metronormativity are likely to ever admit. Um, I'm going to skip to this next paragraph. The picture of the lesbian farmer overlords, quote. <laughs> Seizing control of rural America, satirically painted by Nosowitz, traveled much further as a joke than it did as a conservative conspiracy theory. <clears throat> Some commentators had enormous fun, really, really did, writing elaborate satires about the lesbians who would be donning their flannel and moving to rural America in their U-Hauls, uh, pulled, pulled by Subarus, uh, I added that just now, in order to infiltrate the last conservative landscape remaining in America. In addition to coverage in mainstream media outlets like NBC and Huffington Post, queer-centric media sites like Pink News and climate-focused media sites like Grist, Limbaugh's outrage inspired a shirt a sold-out hat, formerly available on raygun.com, and a self-published satirical novel available on Amazon. I didn't read the novel, but it is looks epic. The novel features lesbians who arrive with laser-shooting dairy cows. 
<laughs> to infiltrate formerly conservative farmland. The idea of queer farmers coming back to the land and calling it home was a bizarre idea to commentators from every political angle. The story only works as a joke if the idea of lesbian farmers is abs as absurd to liberal commentators as it is threatening to conservative ones. Um, and I've <clears throat> talked about that. Um, so I'm not going to read the rest of that paragraph. But um, this chapter that is about the sort of background um, to the spaces is really linked to land. I pulled that one out because I thought that it was an entertaining one before um, looking at some of the more um, serious uh, excerpts. But the, um, the land in the US and the land in South Africa have been shaped by very similar uh, racial um, policies of racial segregation um, that deprived um, black and indigenous people of um, black and other indigenous people of land. Um, and so like a, most of this chapter is really about like forced removal from land. And I mean, that happened to also, it's really interesting to write about land when you're thinking about Appalachia, where we think about most Appalachians as being, West Virginians especially, as being like white, because the, the complications of like, <laughs> having displaced somebody else from their land, and then also being displaced from your land. It's like this um, generational displacement, um, sometimes in the name of conservation, um, you know, to make state parks or, or whatever. Um, it's really, really complicated to think about whiteness in relation to how that dispossession happens. Um, and I, I wrote about queerness in relation to the land. I wanted to write about that because there was a uh, there's there was a very strong discourse in South Africa when I was there about about getting the land back um, because the minority of uh, the minority white population in South Africa owns a majority of the land um, and so um, black South Africans are really adamantly pushing um, to get land back um, and asking the government how they do that how they'll do that and there was no political party in South Africa that had any legitimacy I would say in 2016 I'm, che <laughs> I'm checking with Lexi like that's right right that had any like legitimacy uh, without addressing the question of land and you know I mean for some of them it was sort of like we're not doing that um, and for some of them it was like well we'll redistribute it but like it's going to be complicated and take a long time um, and others were like we'll just do it now um, and so like but you had you had to address that conversation like there's not a political party in the U.S. that has to address that conversation we have the land back movement but we don't have it's not in our mainstream politics in the way it was there and so the lesbian organization that I was working with they were like well, where do we fit into that? Like, if you're going to give land to families, and you see family as like man, woman, even though South Africa has way more progressive laws than we do, um, they were sort of like, you know, how how is it going to happen? Like, where do we fit into it? Are we going to be erased from this? Um, and so, land was really important, and I thought that needed to be. If we're going to talk about like rural queer existence, and we're going to talk about um, like how people have been removed from land and dispossessed of land. Like that had to be center of it. But I don't think that um, queer people have been removed from land in quite the same way. So I refer to that as alienation. Um, because it, we have been encouraged. It's like, go to the city, right? Like, you don't like it here. Go somewhere else. Uh, go, where, go to the gay states. Go to Massachusetts. Go to California. Um, you know. And so it's like, that, that is a kind of alienation from your home. Um, and so what this book is really about is um, uh, you know, how to like, care about your home, um, even when it's not easy, um, and you know, how people are doing that every day. Um, and so I'm going to skip a bunch of things that I had picked out here. One of them, but I will tell you about one of my favorite ones very briefly, uh, which is that uh, when I was in North Carolina, some of the events that I went to there uh, in uh, uh, Mitchell County, which is close to Asheville, um, some, some of the organizing that they were doing, which is around Amendment 1, again, the marriage thing. Um, and marriage isn't actually a thing that I really cared about, but it was really important at the time because it was in 2015, it was inevitable here. Um, Same-sex marriage was going to, I mean, like the federal uh, decision, court decision against 
it or federal policy against it, Delma, had been uh, reversed by the Supreme Court. It was just a matter of time. Um, and so that was all happening here. And that was like very new for us, you know. South Africa, it was 10 years old. Um, and so it was like coming up on the 10th year anniversary. Um, and so it was like really, really important in both places. People were talking about it, thinking about it. Um, and people in North Carolina were just wounded over amendment, amendment one. Like you could not be in a room with people without them talking about like how betrayed, heartbroken, bitter they felt about like how amendment one had played out. Um, and so, um, they, in Mitchell County, they had started these little meetings and it was like a very rural place. And they were, it was like these sort of two groups, like one little group of gays and one little group of like homophobes. They were sort of like back and forth and they had a meeting in the library and outside the library, the homophobes had these signs and they were going, and someone said, this ain't Asheville. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, you don't like it here, go to Asheville. Uh, it's not very far away, and they like you there. Um, and so the, um, somebody said to them, like, what does that mean? What, what does that mean, this ain't Asheville? Um, and they were like, Asheville is the gathering of the gays. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't like Mitchell County. We don't want you meeting here. Shut down your meeting. Get out of the library and go to Asheville. That's where they love you in Asheville. Um, and so I wanted to... Um, just look, maybe one more, yeah, two more, okay. Brief, brief, briefly, okay. Um, so the one that I wanted to read uh, about South Africa has partly to do with language, um, and it also has partly to do with um, hate crimes. Um, the people that I talked to in the US were not thinking about hate crimes the way that people in South Africa were thinking about hate crimes, especially for um, black lesbians in South Africa. Hate crimes have just been a um, really, really awful part of um, the organizing that they've had to do and the way that they've had to like try to protect their, their safety and their communities. And um, that... Um, is part of a bigger dynamic of gender-based violence um, that is um, really bad um, in South Africa. And so they, there's a lot of conversation with folks about, about this, but um, so this deals with, that's your trigger warning, this deals with hate crimes. Um, one of the way that metronormative practices become most apparent um, is through the urgency characteristic of an approach described by Joseph Massad. Um, he's a Palestinian um, gay um, a queer theorist, a uh, wonderful queer theorist and thinker. Um, he describes it as missionary, this urgency. Garth, who is the transgender, and all of these names are pseudonyms, um, is the transgender founder of an organization that works on transgender representation in the media in South Africa, spoke to a d dynamic around urgency that Garth found troubling. Garth described urgency as something that justifies the colonizing presence of researchers from one place who arrive in another place. I have no doubt he was talking to me. Um, looking out from the metropole in the direct direction of out of the way places, those are two terms that I use that I will describe more later maybe if you want to hear about it. The more urgent you appear, the more functional you are. Garth tells another story. They say, I didn't say they in the text. In fact, that interpretation here is the opposite. It just means that you've never been patient with a crisis that we've been dealing with for beyond our life before our birth. Um, and you could think about apartheid is very tangible in that statement, I think. So I think there's something, those clashes, I mean, sometimes I just delete request because this is not going to work. Purely from the point of view that there is still this notion that people want to come and do something. So they want to come and report on, or they want to come and do something about something. And I just think, don't you have problems in your own country? <laughs> <laughs> I know that was aimed at me, like 100%. And the only reason this person consented to an interview with me is because like my best friend <laughs> founded like the original, uh, the first transgender advocacy organization on the African continent. And there's a lot of reverence for her. <laughs> And so I know that that was directly aimed at me, um, as it should have been. But I think the idea of like trying to understand the space here and to respect that space has been very difficult for organizations because sometimes we have to push back and push back very hard to ask people to back off. End quote. Urgency in Garth's account belies an inability or unwillingness to recognize and commit to confronting historical injustices that have staying power. 
For Donna Haraway, very cool feminist um, biologist, staying with the trouble is necessary to sustain cross-species survival and build more livable futures. This is the type of sustained commitment that will be required to address not only queer and trans antagonism, but the deeply intersecting inequalities Makao Mutua, a Kenyan um, legal scholar, identifies as realities that are ignored and obscured by the prioritization of much human rights work. Working for the transformation of all kinds of inequalities from housing insecurity to hate crimes to addressing the structural causes of poverty takes a kind of commitment that urgency cannot often sustain because it means working against entrenched historical factors from the normalization of capitalist exploitation to the architect architectures of racial segregation. A view from the periphery foregrounds the persistence of crises. In queer activist work at the geographical periphery, being patient with a crisis that we've been dealing with for beyond our life, beyond our birth, communicates not only an awareness that crises are not new, but also a recognition that because violence is ongoing, work against violence requires sustained commitment. This is a kind of sustained commitment that cannot afford a fizzle following the initial urgency. I want to be clear that in writing critically about urgency, I'm not suggesting that violence, harm, and death of queer people is not an urgent issue. It is. The organizers I spoke to, however, seem to have a sense that folks who bring urgency from outside of their context to address a single or even multiple isolated incidents do not understand what it means to have to live in the same community. Survivors of violence have to live in the same community with the family of the perpetrators of that violence, and sometimes even the perpetrators of the violence themselves. Addressing violence can take the shape of addressing the aftermath of violence against a person. Garth's organization tells stories of individuals who have been subjected to violence. In the telling of those stories, there is a hope that the organization's efforts will translate into a better community dynamic for queer and trans people in those communities in the future. Whether responding to or working to prevent violence, any attempt to build safer communities for queer and trans people requires building relationships. Relationships cannot be built with urgency at the center because they require staying with the trouble. Um, <clears throat> and there's a couple of stories, oh no. <laughs> there's a couple of stories uh, that are just brief, 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 yeah. Um, one of the people that I talked to, one, one of the people that I talked to uh, who um, worked for an organization that was a really like a, a regional um, kind of funder type of organization uh, responding to a lot of different countries on the continent, uh, t told this story about like a really effective way that um, that they actually were able to come in and kind of translate uh, or talk talk with the local community. Um, one participant spoke about a community-based intervention in an area where there had been a hate crime. The strategies for addressing violence in a community setting that Andile, a young Zulu-speaking activist, speaks about employing below are strategies that rely on knowing how power operates in the community. Andile also had to engage authority figures and community members in a way that emphasized their roles as community members in order to have conversation that resulted in reincorporating a traumatized member of the community back into the fabric of that same community. This is, the, this is a quote, this is an extended quote from Andile. Um, there was a lesbian identifying lady where she was victimized, their pronouns, and I think her ex-partner was killed because she was a lesbian and raped and killed. So my director gave us a task. What can we do there to change the mindset of the guys there? So we told her, let's have a soccer tournament. It was 2010. The World Cup was hosted in South Africa in 2010. Everything was about soccer. Um, we said, we're going to have our soccer tournament with the opening game. Uh, yeah, we got a group of guys. They brought in their kids. We said, this should be a group of guys, of soccer players, but it should be their kids coming to play so they could teach their kids about LGBTI. We got a few drag performers to come into the township, but for us to do that, we first had to engage with the chiefs. So we came in that way and we workshopped the chiefs. We got them into a tavern, like a bar, which is in a township. We sat them down, we bought them beers. Uh, we talked about these things and things changed. Things changed and mostly we managed and she lives there, um, the partner, very happy in the same township. And so it's like that, where we change the people who have power over people first and talking their language, we have to talk to people in their language and in their level. So yeah, that's the challenge we've been having, especially with funders. Funders think that mostly in our developed country, everybody knows English. Yes, the people in the room might all know English. 
but they might not want to be engaged with you in English because firstly, you come in as a gay man. Secondly, you're coming in with English, uh, with something that they think is foreign, and then you're going to be talking it in English. Not only, um, this is end quote, not only is the language of funders laden with foreignness, it is also difficult to imagine a line item in a funding organization in New York City being approved as beer for chiefs. <laughs> <clears throat> Based on Ryan Thorson's account of the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission's relationship with organizations on the African continent, in fact, approval for such a line item would be virtually unimaginable. However, Andile is clear in this example about what facilitated the success of this event and allowed a woman who had been victimized to continue to live very happily in the same township, where the mindset of the guys there had changed. Emphasis on conversation, a focus on building relationships, prioritization of the language that a community itself prefers to speak, and understanding that there are multiple ways to approach a problem resulted in Andile's organization providing a queer person the tools they needed to feel safer in their community. The foreignness of the LGBT rights uh, language uh, can also cause miscommunications when its meanings are not established before conversation about those rights are facilitated. David, who works for an international organization, an office based in Johannesburg, speaks to the role that language can play in misunderstanding among audiences who may use a set of vernacular terms to refer to LGBTIQ people and concepts that don't register in the colonial English lexicon of LGBTI rights. Uh, David says, and so our language is imported. The language of LGBTI is an imported language. If you go into communities and you talk about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people, often they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, but they know they don't want it. And so my experience recently in Malawi with a group of religious leaders was, you know, we talked for an hour about LGBTI people and how we should respect them, the Bible, all of it, all of it. And one religious leader stood up and said, you know what, one day when we encounter these LGBTI people, we will treat them well. <laughs> <laughs> so I then realized that I was talking to them about LGBTI and they were envisaging something totally foreign. So I had to go down to the activists who none of them were out. They were all closeted in their communities. So we had to call a pause to the session, take the activists to a very safe space and say, I know you have discomfort with it, but what in the local languages are the words to describe lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, okay? So most of them I can't pronounce, David says, but it doesn't matter. We'll write them down. I take the flip chart back into the room and I say, I really apologize. I got it all wrong. I just assumed that we all understood the same thing. But the people that I'm talking about aren't aliens from another world. They're, world. they're actually right here. They're in your community. I'm sure they're in your community. They're a part of your congregation. And often we refer to them as, and I just go through the whole list. And you can see the lights coming on because they said, oh, that is what you were talking about. <laughs> Why didn't you say that to begin with? I said, because those words are so negative. They're so loaded. And the religious leaders agreed. It's true. <laughs> These are very negative words. There are very few of them that are neutral in our language, and so, and so, and then the connection was made. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, um, I don't, I wanna be, I wanna answer your questions. So um, I like I had one, um, one more, because the end of the last chapter, I tried to write about um, two organizing events um, that I was involved in in West Virginia. So one here in Buchanan and one in Elkins. Um, and Elkins, um, it's like community-wide mobilization over several months, um, spearheaded actually by a student who's now a grad, um, but she, she was a freshman when she did that. <laughs> she learned that there was no protection um, in housing and employment um, at that time. Now we do have the employment protection, but still not the housing one, but um, she realized that there was not that protection from discrimination for LGBT people, and I think like I think a lot of people were sort of like, yeah, that exists, that has to exist, right? Like That, that can't be legal. Uh, and so she just was like, well, I'm just going to go to the city council and, you know, propose it. And that should be easy. <laughs> uh, and like there was one council member who was just adamantly opposed. Um, and so like for months and months and months, we mobilized the community support. And I mean, the, the beautiful thing for me about that was that like we had pledges from like 70, 80 businesses. I didn't even know there were 80 businesses in Elkins, but we had pledges from 70, 80 businesses in Elkins saying like, we, we think this is a good idea. Like we think... We shouldn't, we don't want to discriminate. Why would we want to do that? Um, and so like that was the more important part to me. We did get a resolution um, passed and it was like very dramatic in the city council meeting. And I talk about that a little bit in the book, but um, in Buchanan, they kind of try to do it quietly. Um, 
and it didn't go so well. It was very ugly. Um, and there were not really a lot of queer people at the uh, public hearing. Um, I was there, but, um, and there might have been like one or two others, but um, it was pretty nasty. And like a lot of people spoke on our behalf and stuff, but there just wasn't the presence that like, we're here, like, you know, why do you want to discriminate against us? Um, and so I tell those two stories, but then I also ask this question about, you know, what does it really, what does it mean to think that we're so white um, in Appalachia and in West Virginia? And how can we, like, do better at um, coalition work and at making sure that we're not just confronting, like, LGBTQ issues, like, we're not just, like, going to the library to protest when they don't want to have the book with two princes who fall in love in it, because that actually happened here. Um, it, actually, I think that's connected to why this bookstore exists. <laughs> um, I've heard that story. But um, you know, we, we don't want to just be, those, don't, those aren't our only issues um, that we should care about. Um, and like whiteness, I, the last chapter is called When Whiteness Gets in the Way. Um, and we, like we want to be able to think about like how whiteness is working um, and how do we um, undermine the um, kind of consolidation of whiteness in any of these organizing activities that we do. So that last chapter is supposed to be like a reflective one and thinking about, um, I write a, I use some of the work of Crystal Good. It's actually just blog posts that she wrote. She wrote about her transgender daughter when her transgender daughter came out. Um, she did move to New York City um, because she describes an experience of feeling like super unwelcome here. And it wasn't about being transgender. It was about being black and transgender. Um, and, you know, when I read that the first time, I was like, oh, well, I'm not like that. Um, and I had that like really defensive kind of reaction of like, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, she's, why is she talking about me? Like, I'm not like that. I didn't do that. Um, but it, it does like, it matters what we advocate for um, and how we do it. Um, and so I tried to, I tried to be vulnerable in that chapter by saying, like, you know, I was caught off guard also by her saying that, um, because like I would want anybody to feel welcome here. But the bigger question is like, how do we do the work where everybody feels welcome? Um, and I don't think it can only be about like resolution, non-discrimination resolutions and um, policies. But I do think that there are things in the that the activists in the book um, describe doing that can like lead the way for for that. So um, I just want to ask you: Do you have any questions? What are your questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of the rounds of edits I did do a to the beach. Actually, was I writing the rest of the chapters? Yeah. OK. So it was a dissertation first. Um, I mean, the dissertation looks nothing like what the book looks like. But, um, but I did write it like from the same data as a dissertation first. Um, and that took me, well, do you remember how long it took me? <laughs> like a couple of years, pro like a couple of years uh, to do that piece of it. Um, and then the book, I, it took a long time, not only though because of the writing, but because, um, so the first, I like my proposal was kind of like three chapters. Um, and so I submitted those three chapters. And then um, there was a funny thing that kept happening. And it happened every time, so I could tell it. But um, like there would be American readers. Um, and so like the press was very like, oh, we want to have like, we have to have like this American reader. And we have to have like a South African reader. And we have to have. And so I was like, that's great. That's great. Let's do that. Um, the American readers always found issues with it. And the South African readers were like, this is it. <laughs> you know, like, they were like, yes. Um, so the South African readers, they like got it. Like, they got what I was saying big time. And the Americans were like, well, you sure. Um, and I think that that speaks to like what I was saying before about like, like how the lens that you use to like look at the world. Um, like queer cultural life is dominated by American kind of, like it's American 
like ideas that shape what that looks like, and they're exported to the rest of the world. But so that kept happening. Um, the first time it was like one one um, reviewer was like, "Don't publish," and the other reviewer was like, "Publish," and then the other one's like, "I'm not sure, maybe some rewrites." Um, and so there were several rounds of reviews, which took like took probably three years. Um, and so like every time that that happened, it, yeah, Evan's right. Um, every time that that happened, it would be like this frantic like rewriting, and then I had to write the three new chapters. I do think I was writing new chapters when we were at the beach. I took my laptop to the beach. We were camping at the beach. I'm like sitting in Evett's car, like with my <laughs> my computer like connected to the battery. And I'm like typing. And then Evett's like, okay, the sun's out and the sun's gone enough that we can go to the beach. It's like, thank God, put the computer away. Make sure I didn't get sand in it. Um, and so it was like that it was a really hectic process of revision, I feel like. But that second chapter I'm super proud of, the one about land, because I just wasn't writing that way. Um, when I did the dissertation. And I think, and I kind of just put all the stuff like at the, the, the South African uh, review system is also really interesting. It's not like where you sit before a panel of people that you've been working with like the whole time that you're a PhD student. It's sent to people who don't know you, but who have been published in that field, like, the, like a real publishing process. Um, and so like two people that I quoted ex extensively in the, um, and probably one I should have quoted more extensively, um, in the dissertation, like they're the people who evaluated it. Um, and like that decides, yeah, whether you pass or fail. So it's more like real publishing, um, but it's, you know, and which one's better, who knows, but, um, cause they also don't have beef with you. Uh, but uh, anyway, they don't have the capacity to have beef with you. They don't know you. Uh, so, you know, that process was like an interesting one, but the review process for the, um, the book was, I, yeah, I, at that time I just sort of sent it out. We just sent it out to the readers. There was no background about either space because I was like, well, <laughs> racial segregation. One had like LGBT legislation, positive LGBT legislation in the 90s. Uh, same sex sexuality, I don't know if you all know this, wasn't decriminalized in the US until 2003. So like, that's all you need to know. <laughs> How about it? Uh, and then someone, one of the South African readers was like, I feel like there should probably be some background about the spaces. Um, and that's where that second chapter came from. So some of it's, uh, so that chapter, I feel like having the time, um, I'm sorry, this is a really long answer to that question, but having the time to sit with it um, and really think about like, if I'm gonna give a background to these two places, what really matters? Um, and to me, that came to be land. Um, so yeah, it, it was a long process, I would say. It was a long process. I don't remember what year it was. I gave that talk on campus, the that first faculty lecture. 2016. But that's where, um, yep, maybe, yeah. But that's where I came up with the title um, as well. And I really, actually, I'm not good at titles, but I really, really love this title. And the American reviewer kept saying, I think you should change the title. And the South African reviewer was like, this title's right on. Um, <laughs> so like, I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so I kept the title, but I, because I really loved it. That would be a hill I would have died on. Um, but yeah, other questions? What other questions do you have? Yeah. Through all the, the work that you describe in the book, it sounds really exhausting. <laughs> and I'm sure it was rewarding. How did you preserve your own sense of energy and purpose throughout all of that? And self care? And I think, um, the promise of friendships, really. Um, because I think really I started on this project. One thing I was going to say to those of you who are you know, young, either going to go into grad school or maybe have already done that, um, is like you you got to care about what you're writing about. And this pisses me off. So like I was mad about this. This is a question I was mad about. And that's what kept me going, f like writing about it. But I really was like, oh my gosh, I can make some friends doing this. <laughs> like, I mean, like I have some friends. But also, like you know, the first several years that I was teaching here, I was mostly students um, who who were the closest friends to me because. I just kind of felt politically like isolated. Um, and so I was like, oh my gosh, I'll get to meet people and make friends. And so that did happen in the US to a limited capacity. And I, Robert, there were some days I would be like, I can't drive. <laughs> I cannot drive to Atlanta one more time. <laughs> like I just can't, I can't do it. Um, and so that, it was really tiring. I don't, I don't know how I did that. But um, in South Africa, like I just, that was such a uh, energy giving space um, to make the kind of relationships that um, 
I was able to form there. Um, and so it was like, I got to be a part of like everything that they were doing, even though, and you know, like if you think about, another thing is like, you know, thing about gender studies has this beef with objectivity, right? Like we just don't believe in it. Um, and part of that's because like whoever's, you know, you're, you're the person who's like doing the thing, like you can only know what you know. Um, and what other people know that you, you know, learned. Um, and so like being in a space where I didn't understand what was going on half the time because people were <laughs> speaking cl close to all the time. I mean, Funeca does not, I didn't tell this story, but it's in here. She, uh, first time she asked me to do something, uh, I said, you know, can I come to this meeting? Can I observe? Can I, I'll record it for you, record it on a, uh, on a audio recorder that I had with me. And she, she said, yeah, sure. Uh, so I came and then she says, you know, she starts the meeting and she, it's all Anisik Klosa, all of it. <laughs> and like, it was all about the marriage act um, cause it was 10 years old. And so like, I knew what was going on. A lot of that language, that legal language is in English. I sort of knew like what he was talking about as he was talking, but there's no way I could transcribe that. But she kept asking me, you know, and I thought, I'm thinking I'm off the hook, right? Like this is not in English, I'm off the hook. She's like, um, uh, Jess, when are you gonna have those, um, <laughs> when are you gonna have those minutes? I'm like, I, huh? Like how, how am I gonna do that? When are you gonna have those minutes? Uh, I don't know. So I sat to sit down with a member of the organization who listened to the recording, told me in English, and then I transcribed it. And I got those minutes made, and I think that's what like got me through the door of being able to spend time with this organization. But like I was part of everything they were doing, even though I couldn't even understand a lot of what was going on. Um, and so like, those friendships were really like the things that um, kept me, um, yeah, made it possible to, to keep going. Other questions? Yeah. Um, well, I don't really have much of a question, but I just wanted to say that um, I'm really excited to read your book. Um, I am not from here. We are here, uh, my mom and I, doing like family history research. Um, but where we live in Southern Maryland is very conservative in a you know a pretty liberal state. <clears throat> so a lot of what you're talking about, I can identify with. Um, for example, we had uh, a friend, my husband and I had a friend who was a farmer, um, a transgender farmer. And, uh, they and their spouse moved to another state that was more friendly. Wow. Um, even though our state is blue, quote unquote, um, our area is not. And last year at one of our high schools, last school year, we had a um, teacher come out as transgender and they were essentially bullied out of their job and now are moving to the other coast. Um, so what you're saying about, you know, your home is where your politics are is extremely true. Um, and my husband and I both considered at some point when we were younger moving out of our area, but decided that we needed to stay because we needed to reflect the way that we, you know, think it should be and try to make it better. And so I really appreciate you putting this out into the world and it's nice to see in other rural areas that, you know, there's some commonality there. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think kind of building off of what uh, that guy was saying, is there any hope for a queer revolution in this country? <laughs> <laughs> Starting here, tonight. <laughs> right this second. Emily, I'm just going to say the one you make. <laughs> I'm going to say, that's what I'm going to say to that. You know, my cousin has a question for me. <laughs> First of all, I, I, have, I have a statement to make that I question. Okay. I just wanted to say, it was the coolest I felt in a long time today when I was on my way here. Somebody asked me where I was going. I was like, I was with my cousin. About the north south, we're too far south to be north, too far north to be south. And if you want to say all four directions in one statement, we're actually located right now in south, eastern, north central West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all, you know, relative. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the question I have for you is the title. Was there like a was there like a light bulb moment when you're like, home three politics on? That's the one. Like, how did you come to the title? Jeez, I don't remember. I just, I don't remember. I don't remember. I was doing that talk, and I had to have a title for that talk. And 
I don't remember how it came up, but I just was, I just loved it after I, and then I got so mad when those reviewers were like, I think you should change the title. I'm not changing the title. Um, so yeah, it's one of the few titles that I really love of work I've done, but I, yeah, I don't have one. So another cousin of ours also described that sort of north south thing. She moved to this is Mary. She moved to North Carolina, and I love this. But she said to, she said to me that some people were saying something to her about the South, and she's like, I am not from the mother effing South, because she's, she's from West Virginia. And I was like, oh, according to my yeah. <laughs> Lexi, um, did you have a question? I have lots of like, deep cuts, dissertations about publishing questions that we'll address another time. But um, we have to have ever food for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about the ways in which, and this is like, coincidentally, this has like, come up multiple times this week in my life of, uh, yeah, like most Americans, I think, just because of the media, right? Like you think of Africa, this enormous continent, yeah. and you think like, oh, it's all like starving children with kwashiorkor or in like uh, mud huts, right? And like this kind of image of Africa and the way it's portrayed. And then I feel like a similar thing, right? Of like the rest of the country use West Virginia as this like mm -hmm. forgotten place. It's so rural. It's like hillbillies and whatever. Um, so I was kind of wondering, like you said, what were some of the maybe well-intentioned misconceptions you had? And like, what do you remember the first time you arrived in South Africa? Like some of those things that started to change how you thought about the land and the place and the people. Dang. Um, <laughs> I thought that question was going somewhere else. Okay. And I was prepared to answer the other place I thought it was going. Um, <laughs> no, it's OK. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, so I definitely was like, oh, you know, this is so embarrassing. I don't know if I can say this out loud. Um, you know, Mandela is really, you know, like. And, uh, and in fact, in 2016, like, there, <laughs> young people were having a moment around Mandela. <laughs> And they were like, is he really our hero? He sold us out to capitalism, um, you know, because we could have, uh, you know, we were, we, were, we were at the point where we were sort of trying to, should we go in a more socialist direction, um, you know, or should we do what the West uh, International, the IMF wants us and everybody, the UN, everybody else wants us to do, um, and open the markets. Um, and they decided to do the latter. Um, and so like, I think like there's a lot of frustration. I mean, in 2016, when I was there, they had the roads must fall, which was aimed at the statue, but then fees must fall, which shut down universities across the campus because students <coughs> were protesting um, the increase in fees. Um, and they, they said they, you know, they were really advocating for free education. <laughs> But, uh, but they shut down every university in the country um, because their, that movement was so powerful. And so like, they were really having a moment there with, uh, with, with, with Mandela and reckoning with like, his legacy. Um, and you know, like, he was in an impossible situation. But I think you know, I had sort of like this, oh, like, you know, there was, oh, it's like all these other colonial struggles were like, uh, this is so embarrassing. Uh, where I'm being very vulnerable here, people. Uh, these colonial struggles were so like, you know, like violent, and they wanted all the white people gone, like Zimbabwe, right? Um, you know, but like South Africa is like really, you know, like Rainbow Nation. Everybody's welcome there, um, and so like this. Uh, uh, I don't know that I would have called it like post-racialism, but the idea that you know, like every, truth and reconciliation means everybody's getting along now and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the naivete that I would think of. And then I remember very specifically, Mel and I, hi, that year, she, this woman works harder than anybody I know, but I think that year she worked she wasn't expecting to go. She was expecting to be like a volunteer in her sabbatical. You know, she was going to volunteer with this organization, a really cool organization that houses girls who have been living on the streets. Um, and they, you know, they come in off the streets and they're just wild. Um, and then, you know, they settle down and they um, go, they get enrolled in school and they go back to school and all this stuff. But in the meantime, you have to kind of get them used to school. So there was this like morning school thing. She was having to do like South African education for kids. One week there was an infant in the room. And like one week, there was like a 26-year-old who never learned how to read. Um, and so I remember thinking very, very clearly, sort of like, oh, you know, like, oh, they'll be, I definitely had this one, they'll be so grateful, you know, like, <laughs> we're there to help them, right? And they'll be, they'll, they're, you know, they'll be so grateful because we're there, we're there to help them. And those girls were like, 
you. Um, you know, they tried to stab us. They tried to, you know, like hit us. They tried, you know, like what you name it. Like uh, they they were trying to do it, and um, you know, uh, so it's like just those things of thinking that, you know, like, oh, people are going to really be grateful for your help and that kind of, um, what do they call it now, um, volu volunteerism, that, that kind of, I mean, we weren't, we were there for a whole year, which, which actually, you know, it was a learning curve too to say goodbye because these kids saw us every day for like a whole year and I, I what I, interrupted myself when I was telling the story about Mel, but she showed up there and, you know, she's like, I'll file papers, you know, I'll sweep up in the office, I'll do whatever as a volunteer. They said, our education director has just resigned. <laughs> um, would you like to be our interim education director? <laughs> so in the morning, she's doing, you know, education for all of these girls uh, to try to get them ready to go back to school. And there's all just different, you know, she was South African geography, South African history, you know, basic English, basic math, um, all this kind of stuff. And then in the afternoon, we were tutoring um, their homework in a different place. And then um, our favorite project was in another area. That's the one we took Cindy Way Magona to, but kids would go there after school. And so I think I, we did a lot of stuff at that time that I wouldn't do now. Like we always rode tr public transportation, um, which like a lot of, um, the people who are there, white people who are there from other countries, um, wouldn't do. And we did that even, <laughs> we would be like the only white people on the bus. And these grannies, they would be so sweet. And they would be like, do you know where you're going? <laughs> you know, like, are you, are you going to the right place? You know, did you miss your stop? <laughs> um, and we'd be like, no, we know where we're going, you know? And we were like, the, the organization, unfortunately, was still very segregated. And so like the childcare workers were all black and the administrators were all white. And um, we were like, but the childcare workers ride the bus. Like, why would we not ride the bus? Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, I think just really, Trying, trying to connect with people um, is the thing that like busted the naivete for us, but also being kind of like, oh, we're trying to help these girls and they still don't like us, but it's okay. Yeah, like, that's okay. Um, that helps you get over some fragility, I think, too. And we got to do some really cool things with them. Um, and it was hard to say goodbye, but also it was really like a wake up call around you know, kind of going and being somewhere for a short time and people like getting used to your presence there and then you're gone again, like what that must be like for for folks, which is also the story of a lot of researchers, um, which is why some of my friends in South Africa, they love this book um, be, because uh, they're like, these are the researchers that came here and I did this and then I left. Um, and then they talked this crap about us. Um, and so I, I feel like I try to be like accountable um, to them in the book as well. I don't know if that answered the question or not, but it definitely embarrassed me. So <laughs> I mean, I embarrassed myself. So I think, so I think it answered the question. Um, any other things or do I need to shut up? Toy to science of books. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> Abigail or John, do you want to give some instructions for book signing? Oh, um, let's meet for sign. I meant for buy now, sign later, sign first, buy oh, then. Sign and then buy? Sign, yeah, sign, yeah, buy. sign and buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then thank you to the whole Benjamin crew for <laughs> hosting us. Uh, <laughs> Oh my God, no pressure. <laughs>